Hello, today we are going to talk about a chapter called The Myth of Non-Accent uh, from a book by Libby Green. Uh, we'll learn why the concept of accent is actually a myth. But what is a myth and what are its function? According to the text, a myth is a story with general cultural significance in which the veracity or truth is secondary because it symbolizes human experience more generally. Functionally speaking, a myth, the writer says, uh, is used to justify social order and to encourage or coerce consensual participation in that order. Imagine that. So, a myth is not just a thing of imagination. It is also a useful practical tool to force people to behave in a certain way. And in this uh, chapter, the writer is talking about how the concept of standard language and non-accent are also myths. And if you have thought what standard language is, it is, uh, the writer says, an idea in the mind rather than a reality, a set of abstract norms to which actual uses may conform to a greater or lesser extent. You know, in school settings, we have always been asked to use the standard one uh, and not the non-standard one. So, um, the writer is saying this concept of standard language and non-standard language are actually not um, a reality. Um, it is rather just an idea in the mind. We have an ideal language in the head to which we try to conform, but that ideal is never really a reality. We all speak a certain variety of language rather than the standard one. And people have used these concepts of accent and standard language as powerful tools, tools, and because uh, they can force people to behave in a certain way. And we'll see how. But let me talk about the concept of accent first. What is an accent? Uh, technically speaking, an accent is used to distinguish stress in words. Say, the second syllable of the word banana is accented, means you put more stress on it, speak it louder, then accent can also mean stress on a uh, on a word in a sentence. It can also indicate a diacritic, you know, the marks that certain words in different languages have, like Spanish. But the sense in which we'll talk about the word accent in this chapter is that accent is a way of speaking. You know, it is not a bad way of speaking. It is not a good way of speaking. It is just a way of speaking. And people speak differently. And the writer is also telling us that accent is a concept in this way can only be understood if you compare it with someone else. So you travel to a small town in Kansas and unless you're actually from that area, your accent will be seen as the difference between your speech and the local speech. So if you have never traveled outside your own community, you will possibly not realize that you have an accent. But the moment you travel to other places where people speak differently, you will understand, okay, these people have accents. Actually, we all have an accent because um, we will know from this chapter. Now, when you talk about the word accent, other two words come in play. One is dialect and the other is language. So when you talk about accent, 
we, we focus on how people sound. So two varieties of a single language are distinguished by accent. When differences are restricted primarily to phonology, prosodic and segmental features. So African American English, for example, has a different accent than British English, for example. But the word dialect is used to mean something more. So if two varieties of a single language also differ in morphological means word structures, syntax or sentence structures, lexicon, vocabulary, and semantics or meanings, then they are different varieties or dialects of the same language. Consider British English, American English, African American vernacular English. They are all Englishes but they have different words, different sentence structures sometimes, and different meanings as well. So, but these varieties will be called a language if they differ in all these ways, in terms of phonology, in terms of sentence structures and word, but also if they have distinct orthographies or, or a writing system or they have in different geopolitical boundaries. So English, Spanish and German are three different languages. They have different writing systems, they have different center structure, they have different sound system and so on. Accent can be of two types, L1 accent uh, or first language accent. It is the structure variation in language and typically when you talk about accent, we, we associate it with people's geography. So people from different places speak differently. So they have different accent like a Maine accent, a New Orleans accent an Appalachian accent, a Utah accent, but we also connect it to people's social identities like Native American accents, Black accents, or Jewish accents. So our accents, our language differences um, are due to a lot of reasons. Our geography, our social identities, our gender, ethnicity, income, even religion, all these things also are a factor in our language differences. So overall, an L1 accent in the US is the native variety of US spoken English. So every native speaker of US English has an L1 accent, no matter how unmarked, unmarked the person's language may seem to be. So the person who speaks the most standard language also speaks an accent. That's the L1 accent. Now, the next one is L2 accent or second language accent. So it's different from L1. Oh, so when a native speaker of a certain language other than English, for example, learns English, so accent is um, used to refer to the breakthrough of the native language phonology into the target language. So let's make it a bit more simple. A person who speaks Tagalog, for example, and learns English, in their learning, that person will show the impacts of the phonology of the sound systems of the native Tagalog language. So a person who speaks Spanish primarily, uh, but learns, to, learns uh, to speak in English, the Spanish language phonology will ha have an impact on how that person speaks in English, right? So a lot of people can control this accent, but um, not many have uh, good successes really. And we'll talk about those things here in this chapter. Okay, the problem is, in spite of all the hard evidence that all languages change, people tend to believe that a homogeneous, standardized, one-size-fits-all language is not only desirable, it is truly a possibility. And not only that, we also tend to 
just people based on this imagined sameness in accent and continually tell them to lose their accent and replace it with another. Now, can you lose one accent and replace it with another? A typical linguist will initially answer, no, we cannot just lose one accent and replace it with another. If you spoke American English all throughout your life, if you go to U the UK, you just cannot lose your American accent and replace it with the British so easily. Uh, because it is not possible for an adult to do so in a permanent way. Things come back. There are some exceptions, of course. You know, uh, the actors, for example, they oftentimes fake an accent on the set. That is possible after a lot of practice. But when it comes to a long-term change, it is a challenge people can do for a brief period of time. Uh, and the linguist possibly would also ask a question if you ask this one to them. That is uh, the question of why. Why should we have to lose an accent? The textbook gives an example of a man who applied for a promotion and was told that his accent is too low class for the job he wants to do. Now, do you think people should be denied a promotion because they speak English in a certain way? Lippy Green talks about some dry facts about language, especially when it comes to how we sound. First, the writer says, there is an infinite set of potentially meaning-bearing sounds, vowels, consonants, and tones, which can be produced by human vocal apparatus. The set in its entirety is universal, available to all human beings without physical handicap. So as humans, we can make infinite set of sounds. His languages, say English and Spanish, uses some but not all sounds available to a human. Children are born with the ability to produce the entire set of possible sounds, but they eventually restrict themselves to the ones they hear used around them. The writer also says, children were exposed to more than one language during the language acquisition process may acquire more than one language if the social conditioning factors are favorable. So if you have two languages being spoken at home, you will grow up learning both of them if your parents want to. Now, we tend to lose that uh, advantage as we reach our adolescence. So we cannot accord the language with the same comport as young children. And the writer is also stating that there are things about accent, our cognition and perception that we have not understood much over time. These are related to why certain adults manage to acquire a new language phonology or accent quite easily more easily than others, why and why some other people cannot. So we have to keep these things in mind when we think about accent. In order to explain the concept of accent and why everyone has one, Lippy Green comes up with a wonderful analogy, which is the concept of a sound house, it's talking about how our accent is, is a kind of house that we keep building up as we grow up uh, uh, from our family, from our school, from our life outside home and school. So our accent is like a house. If you read the sound house analogy, you'll have several takeaways and I wanted to summarize it for you. 
So the first thing E.P. Green talks about in that soundhouse analysis is that kids have blueprints to learn a language spoken in the surroundings. So it helps them learn multiple languages and varieties really. So uh, if you have uh, a family speaking more than one languages, you will grow up speaking both. But our socialization impacts our language learning decision like suppressing one and promoting another. A lot of immigrant families tend to lose their home language because they're uh, pressured by the outside forces to learn only, only English and forget the one that they speak at home. When we become an adult, we tend to lose the blueprints that a kid has and we have to work with bare hands to build our sound house or accent and uh, we we lose the natural natural advantage that a kid has in learning a language formal instruction can help your language learning you can go to classes and benefit from it but uh, not as much as a kid does in learning the same language so the age makes a difference a strong motivation can also help you learn a different language other than your initial one. Uh, you can do almost anything in the world if you are motivated to learn a given language. You can also benefit from immersion, like exposure to the target language. So if you want to learn German, if you go to Germany, then you, you have a greater probability for learning that language, you know. But as we uh, keep learning a different language and additional language, uh, it often uh, forces us to neglect our previously learned languages or varieties. You know, so uh, that's a problem. Lippy Green is also talking about how there are so many prominent people with an accent, with an L2 accent. They never lost it. Uh, they never managed to build an English sound house which would fool anybody into thinking that they are native speakers. But their ability to use English is clear. It includes actors and actresses, but it also includes poets like Derek Walcott, you know. So, uh, these are the people who spoke English with a, with a second language accent and they still succeeded in their life. Now, you may ask, do people like this choose to speak English with an accent? Have they not worked hard enough, long enough to sound American? Are they not smart enough? They are smart. They are American. They, they, they put in a lot of hard work in learning the language and they become famous. They did what they were supposed to do in their career. The second language accent didn't stop them. There are some famous people with an L1 accent. When I think of Jimmy Carter, Jesse Jackson, Rosie O'Donnell, people generally think that they have an accent. Now, whether you like or dislike them as individuals, they're all excellent communicators. Do they willfully refuse to give up Georgia, African-American, or New York varieties of English for something less socially marked? Or are they incapable of doing so? The writer doesn't think so. People have an accent. It reflects who they are. It reflects on their identity. They don't have to change it because we all have an accent. The idea that only some people have an accent is a myth, a misconception that we need to get rid of.